salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song.
is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord of Heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. There is no other God. Who is like me? Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one.
Good morning. Let us pray. Our great and gracious Father, give us eyes to see your beauty. Give us ears to hear your music. Give us a voice to sing your songs of grace, love, and peace. Let us reach out to those vulnerable people who are crying out for help, who feel lost and that their voices are not heard. Let us make ourselves available to them and show them your love. Father, may those Christians in politics trust in you to make the right decisions that affect our families, our elderly, and our other vulnerable people. Help them not to back down from the, their principles of their faith when they are challenged by opposition from other pol politicians on vital decisions affecting our lives and the lives of our children, and especially the education and school programs. Father, May we keep the mayor of the city in our prayers, that he will use his faith to make better laws and policies for all the people of Winnipeg. Father, thank you so much for the much needed rain that you have blessed us with, as well as the cooler weather that we have had in the last couple of weeks. It was so needed by everyone. Thank you, Lord, for all your goodness. You bless us all every day with your unfailing love and forgiveness. Let us never forget the freedoms that we have to worship you without fear. Thank you, Lord, for all the new people that are coming to Portage Avenue Church. We are so blessed to have them here and, and can call them family. We love you, Father, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. raising up our, our children. I absolutely recommend other people help out. We should have faith like a child and, and you really get to see it firsthand when you're teaching Sunday school about how, what our faith should look like and just the, the trust and, and belief we have in, in our Lord. And it's fun. working out the technicality. especially within some sorrow because uh, Peter and Marie Duick 
uh, lost their grandson at the age I am so sorry. Peter and Marie Duick lost their grandson at, at the age of 36, uh, Andrew Newfeld. And so we want to lift up the Duick family and the Newfeld family. Can we just stop everything? And this also gives our sound team some time to figure out what's going on. And let's just uh, say a prayer for them. Heavenly Father, uh, in the midst of so much... Um, so much misunderstandings, so much unanswered questions. We come before you today and we ask, Lord, that you would reign in our lives, that we would trust in who you are, in your power and your authority, that you ultimately have a great plan for each one of us. And I pray, Lord, for the Duick and the Newfeld family, that you would just be with them, that you would comfort them, and that you would remind them that you continue to have a plan for each one of them. Lord, I pray that you would be with them right now as they're, as they're mourning the loss and also celebrating the life of Andrew. We ask this all in Jesus Christ's name, the name above every name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I also want to make you aware, you saw this video again of our, uh, of our need for Sunday school teachers. And I want to encourage you, but I'm actually a little biased because I'm helping out with the youth. So I need youth workers. So if you're new to the church uh, and you've been around for a little while and you're saying, I want to get involved, a wonderful way to get involved is with our youth. So I just want to encourage you to please come and talk to me and I'll, I'll get you plugged in, I promise. There's plenty of work here at Portage Avenue Church. There is no shortage of work that is needed. So uh, if you want to get plugged in, we've got lots of opportunities, even beyond just children's ministry and youth ministry. But we do realize how important it is and for the future of the church. I also want to say uh, in room three, there is more items that have been added. We asked you all, especially if you were new to the country, you were new immigrants, to please look at room three because there's lots of, of uh, donations that were given to us and we need to get things out of room three. Well, I just went downstairs to look at room three and somehow there has been stuff added to the room. Not taken away, it's been added. We need it empty at some point. So I want to encourage all of you, if you're, if you're new to the country, you're a new immigrant, uh, and you're here at Portage Avenue, we have a room dedicated for you to go and look at and take whatever you want. Heck, there's a piano in there. If you want to get that piano out of there, hallelujah, it's yours. Wait, I didn't ask the council for that one, but... <laughs> anything that's in there, just go for it. But there's been a lot of clothes added and uh, particular toys. And so please, if you've gone last week and you said, well, I already took a few items, go and look again. There's much that has been added. That is almost all that I want to say, except for one more item. I was so excited. I watched it online. I got to see a South Korean wedding just a few weeks ago, and they are here only for today. Tomorrow they go to BC. Can please Philip and Judy just stand up and let's put our hands together as they are married now. Yeah. We're so excited. So excited. You two were such a blessing. In case you're not aware and you're new to the church, Philip was our intern for the last two years. And we have been so blessed by both of you. And we're praying for you with your journey to BC. And uh, blessings, and we love you. Okay. Well, you have only today. I just found out they're here only for today. So if you want to get talk to them, you want to catch up, you want to pray for them, you got today. And then it's... You got to either fly to BC or go online at that point. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we had a, we've been going through the journey uh, through Genesis, and now we're at Abraham. And I found myself, I was surprised how I found myself quickly going past this fulfilled promise because we spent a whole chapter on Abimelech and the tragedy of that. And we talked about that last week. And then we have just a few verses about how God fulfills the promise. Everything that has been leading us, we've been spending months and chapter after chapter leading us to this point. We just have a few verses and then we go to another tragedy. 
with Ishmael and Hagar. And we're going to talk about that next week. And so sandwiched in between these two tragedies, you have, you have the fulfillment of the promise. And I don't want to just skip over it quickly. I actually want to sit with it and spend a lot of time uh, discussing it with you today. I think of the Apostle Paul that says this in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 17. It says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. Such thankfulness ushers in the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit and God's mighty presence. And so we surely don't want to quickly gloss over what just happened, the fulfillment of this promise. We want to sit with it. We want to reflect and recognize the significance of this reality and thank the almighty God. If we call ourselves God's children, followers of Jesus, then this miracle should speak to us all because we were all born. Yes, we were all born out of this miracle. Remember, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, we have a new family. So let us read this short story today, starting in Genesis chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 1. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. I want to turn your attention to just a little bit of a different translation, a more literal translation in the New American Standard. It says this in verse 1, Then the Lord took note of Sarah. It's important to put that in, took note. And what does it mean? Well, in the Greek, it means, it's quite a descriptive word. It means to observe. It means to pay attention to. It means to focus upon. It means to seek out. See, the almighty God, Jehovah, is seeking out and focused his attention upon Sarah. And why is that significant for us to note? Why do we need to know that? Because without God's intervention, there is no way on God's green earth that Sarah should be or could be biologically pregnant. There's no way. It cannot happen. It is literally impossible. So the text is making it very clear that God intercedes and makes the impossible a reality. And the Bible wants us to be very clear on this matter. This is, there's nothing that Abraham and Sarah could have done at this point. Way past their prime to have children. Sarah's 90, Abraham's 100. This only happens through God's intervention. Now, I want to ask of you is, depending on your perspective, whether you follow Jesus Christ or you follow any other gods or no God at all, you can have a host of different perspectives and view on miracles. But here's what you can't do. If you were living in the time of Abraham and Sarah's life and you saw a 90-year-old woman with a big bump, what would you presume whether you knew Jesus or God or anything, you would say that is supernatural, right? There's evidence. It's not, it's not a theory. It's not a, a funny or an idea or that's your perspective. No, it's physical. It's a tangible, supernatural event. It doesn't matter whether you follow a God or not. You would have to presume that this is out of the ordinary. I mean, just a little bit later, you're going to see a 90-year-old woman nursing a child. This is not normal. You would have to draw some conclusion, have to say there is something going on here. 
Now, what you do next is where interpretation can happen. Okay? So, if you were, say, um, in the ancient world and you followed the various gods of the time, you might attribute it to a fertility god that provided some miracle. What kind of gods of this world could we attribute it to? But see, it's really important that you see this, that you understand this, that Abraham doesn't stay silent about this miracle. Remember, he is in hostile territory, the land of Canaan, so hostile that he is actually having to hide his marriage to his own wife. That's how much fear and anxiety is going on, depending on the territory that he enters into. This is a place that is not always conducive for someone and someone that follows this particular God. And so you, you might presume, and maybe some of you would just sort of stay silent about the whole matter. Well, we privately know what's going on, but we keep it to ourselves. But that's not what Abraham does. Look what he does. We find out in verse 4, it says this. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. They circumcised Isaac eight days later. What was circumcision? And I'm not speaking literally what the procedure was. What was it that circumcision meant spiritually, symbolically? Well, if you go back, we read about it in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. I just want to read you a few excerpts. It says this, Then God said to Abraham, Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. And it goes on. Let me just go to verse 13. When God says, all must be circumcised, your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. Therefore, let's just, we just recap this with me here. Therefore, the mark of the everlasting covenant, your allegiance is to Lord Jehovah. That's what it means. It is a marking that consecrates you before the living God. This is a public declaration that we are marked differently than the other philosophies and gods of this world. And this is so significant because Abraham makes this public declaration that this child, this miracle, is not associated with any other God, but this is brought about by the almighty God, Jehovah, and is dedicated to him as a holy sacrifice. See, we are marked. We are marked people. And we are called to live it out. We are called to be different, even in the midst of a hostile territory. We declare the gospel that will transform lives, and thus we speak out and we declare it, even in the land of Canaan and beyond here in Canada. I find it alarming how, or not even alarming, it's sort of exciting, but also alarming that God asks us to join in this adventure of going out and reaching the nations. Now, we do it by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, but we're called to go out, and you see it in the book of Acts, right? They speak, between, they speak among religious leaders, princes, kings, Market squares, they go anywhere that they possibly can go to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And what do we find? We find that it is extraordinarily polarizing. Some come to faith and give their lives to Jesus, and others fight against it, especially the powerful and the authorities fight against it. And I believe it still needs to be polarizing today. I mean, I'm sure there were people in the book of Acts that said, why can't you just keep it to yourself? But no, that's not our heritage. That's not God's people. It's not what we came from. We are invited to, to participate in this adventure as the apostles do in the book of Acts. And we see Abraham declaring the lordship of Jehovah by this circumcision. I mean, there was something different, even if we go back, back into the book of Acts. If we go into Acts chapter 4, don't you notice there's something different going on here? They're speaking, a, um, uh, speaking you know, 
we're thinking of Peter and John are speaking to the most powerful leaders in the Jewish community, the, to the Sanhedrin court. And they're amazed that these simple fishermen are able to speak with such authority. And the text tells us they can tell that these two have been with Jesus. See, there is a marking upon their lives. It's clear there's something different going on here, whether you like it or not, because the Sanhedrin persecuted the early church. But they recognized there was something different about these two. They were not of the world. And in this story, in Genesis chapter 21, we see Abraham in a hostile to territory declaring Jehovah's lordship by saying that this child is a miracle. It is, he is not, he's making it clear that no one else gets the credit. And I believe we are called to be marked differently as God's children. It should be declared and clearly defined so we are not mixed up with all of the crazy and destructive gods of this land. Is there a marking on your life or do you live just like everyone else in the land? Do you share and live out the gospel or, or do you just try to fit into this world because it's easier, more convenient? I ask of you, are you putting away those activities that are contrary to God's word? Or even more so, are you resisting those organizations, even some of them that historically you've loved and associated with, but are now working against God's word? Are you resisting it? Are you resisting the governments and the structures that are opposing God's word? Or do we just try to ignore it and fit in? Because it's the easier course. Christians are not meant to fit in. We are meant to stand out and then speak out. We stand out because our lives are different. We live differently. And then we're called to speak out. We see the examples of this time and time again by our forefathers and foremothers. And we are called to live differently and proclaim it to the world. It's time. It's time, brothers and sisters, for us in, here in the West to actually take a stand and speak out. And that is the example we have here in Genesis chapter 21. Secondly... I, I want to point out to you, this passage makes it really clear that God makes the impossible a tangible reality. I've talked to you about this time and time again. I brought it up in sermon after sermon. So why do I keep bringing it up to you? Well, maybe it's because I find that myself as a Christian, that my prayer life does not reflect this reality. So often I settle for something that's rather mundane. You know, my prayer life, I can pray for the food on the table. Nothing wrong with that. I can pray for my family, pray for safety. But I think that the Lord has so much more in store for us. I feel like at times I, my prayer life can be like that of, a, of an infant. I'm on milk and liquid. And God wants me to get the barbecue out and start eating steak. Amen? Okay, some of you are not as excited about that as I am. This weather's not getting me excited about my barbecue coming up. Let me put it another way. Are we bold in our prayer life? Let me give you an example, right from Jesus' teaching. Uh, but I'll give you this example. I, I love my children, and in this stage, they are still young. And when I come home, they drop everything to be with their dad. And they think the world of their father. And I want you to know that sadly over time, uh, they're going to learn that I am less than perfect. That I have faults. I have problems. But in this season of life, I'm taking it in. My kids are of that age. They ask the craziest demands of their father. They think dad can do it. He can fix it. And I don't want to break their little hearts. And I got to be honest with you. Uh, I'm going to let you in on a secret. I don't know how to fix half of it or most of it. I fake it. But I try my best because they come to me with every demand possible. 
and they think dad can fix it. He can figure it out. And sometimes, you know, what's so wonderful about children is they make you as a father be better because they believe in you so much. I mean, it's just ridiculous. My, my daughter will jump off the stairs. I'm not even looking at her half the time and I have to turn around quickly and catch her. And I'm going, like, she is 100% sure that dad is going to catch her. 100%. I mean, that to me is just phenomenal. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I mean, and I know this imagery doesn't work in line with God because unlike this father, Jedediah, there is a father, a heavenly father that is, can do anything that is perfect, that can fix anything, that has no faults. And that is Lord Jehovah. He can do beyond anything we could ever even imagine. He is the almighty God. Remember that benediction to him who is able to do more than we could ever think or even imagine. That's the God we are serving. And time and time again, my children are rushing to their dad, embracing their dad, believing in their dad. And then we see this imagery in, in the gospels of the children rushing to Jesus. And Jesus says, do not hold these children back. Because the disciples are trying to like shoo them away. He says, don't do that. And then, he, and then he even says, if you want to be part of God's kingdom, inherit the kingdom, you must be like these children. And I think there's a lesson here for you and me. Do we approach God like a child? Are we speaking to the almighty God in such bold and courageous ways as my children do. Let me just give you another example. Is, is Adina even here? Is she gone? Dinah, come on up. Come on up. Hurry. Come on up. She is so nervous and I was hoping to not have the mic. Okay. So when I get home, are you okay? Okay. She wanted to do this. When I get home, my children jump on me and this is what they do. And they just don't stop doing it. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I don't want to do, but again, daddy, again, here we go. Watch what they do. Okay. Ready? Go. <laughs> and I sit there and then do it again. Come on. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they do tricks upside down. Yeah. Good job. Good job. They, they'll do tricks upside down and put their feet straight up and I'm just holding them. And sometimes I come home and I go, you know, I, I've got a little back pain. I pinched my back. They don't care. They do not care. I have a bicep problem right now from my weightlifting. They don't care. They do it again and again and again. They're persistent. It's unbelievable. Their tenacity, it just doesn't end. And it's not just one of them. They all do it. And then they're fighting to get in line to do it. This is what is going on in our household as I come home. And I wonder, is our prayer life like that? Are we persistent and begging and pleading with the Lord Jesus Christ? And boldly praying and asking for something that is so beyond our own ability. Because God can do the impossible. Or do we just simply, you know, thank him for the food that's on the table, which is important. But doesn't our prayer life need to go beyond that? One of my mentors used to remind me time and time again and say to me, Jedediah, those that ask for little get little. And those that ask for much will experience much in their life. It comes back to this parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. The one that had much and invested it got even more. And the one that had little and hid it in the dirt lost all that he had and was thrown into the fire because it served no good for the kingdom. And I just wonder if we are trying to hide our talents and not utilizing that which God has given us. And that is the power of the almighty God. Are we settling? Sometimes I wonder if I am. I wonder sometimes I go, you know what? I play it safe in my prayer life. Maybe I need to be a little bit more courageous and bold. I think we underestimate the almighty power of God. And even Abraham did it. Made mistakes several times in his own journey. And God had to continue to remind him of his promise and his faithfulness to fulfill it. Even in spite of the human impossibility. 
And I get it, each one of us, we all have doubts. We go through seasons, hard times, we have fears, we have times where we're just weak and worn out. And we just don't have the strength sometimes to believe. We're sort of like that father that says, I believe, but help my unbelief. We, we see these impossible feats and we just don't think there's any hope. But let me tell you, that just can't be the norm or the, the regular relationship we have with God. We have to see him for who he is. We are speaking to the one that works in the impossible. I mean, our whole people group, brothers and sisters, if you call yourself a Christian, our entire people group came and was born out of Sarah, who was 90 years of age. And the one that we worship, Jesus Christ, came from a virgin birth. We must understand that God works with this impossibility. And he does it to exemplify his power and his might to a broken world. In your life, I just want to ask you, point blank, I've had to ask myself this. What is the impossible situation in your own life? Maybe, it is, maybe it's a circumstance at work. Maybe it's your relationship with your family. I don't know what it might be that seems impossible. That you just can't see a way that it could be changed. But I ask of you, are you praying boldly and courageously for God to intervene? I believe the Lord has so much more in store for us. Lastly, I want to bring up this last point to you. And this one's going to take us on a little bit of a journey here. Uh, and this idea of laughter. I want to go back a little bit because laughter has been throughout this promise. This promise of Isaac. We see this imagery of laughter with Sarah a few chapters prior who laughs when the living God gives the promise to Abraham and Sarah and says, next year, this time, you will have a child. Do you remember that story? She started laughing. And then she was behind a, she was in the tent and then God called her on it. And then she lied, which is never a good idea to lie to God. God knows. That's a bad strategy. And God calls out and says, no, you did. You laughed. And we see in chapter 18 how Sarah describes herself. In that passage, I talked about this at length, but I want to bring it up again. She mentions, and in the, in the, in the Hebrew text, uh, it makes it clear that... Um, her body is that of decaying or rotting. She's decaying. She's a rotting corpse. In other words, she is all but dead in her elderly age. She is defeated. She is not going to have children. And when I think of her laughter in the disbelief of what God had promised, I go back to Job uh, chapter, starting in chapter 38. And I want you to just hear this. I'm going to read quite a few verses. And I'm not even reading nearly all of them. They're actually, it actually goes over several chapters. But I want you to hear this. When Job started questioning God's intentions, listen to what God says in response. Job chapter 38 says this. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. By the way, when God says gird up your loins, <clears throat> get ready. It's coming. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? And when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made cloud its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it and I set a bolt and doors and I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. 
Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It, 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 it is changed like clay under the seal and they stand forth like a garment and from the wicked their light is withheld and the uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. And then God continues and continues. I would encourage you to read Job chapter 38 and chapter 39, but I don't have time to read it all. And it's, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, all that he asks and all the questions. And then finally, in chapter 40, at the very beginning, God says, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's criticism, but do you have the answers? And in light of the mighty presence of God and experiencing this awe and wonder of the vastness and the greatness of God and seeing how small Job is in the midst of this interrogation, he says these words, I am nothing. Let me say that again to you. Job, in light of experiencing God's mighty presence and getting even just a glimpse of who he is speaking to and who he was questioning, he says these words, I, that is Job, am nothing. Argument is over, period. See, we are speaking to the almighty God in the midst of his power, all the questions are done because we can't even fathom the greatness of the living God. It is so beyond us. And in light of God, we see how small we are in the enormity of who we are speaking to. We need to stop having this small picture of who we are speaking to, but recognize the enormity of it and speak to him as the picture reflects in Job chapter 38 and 39. And if we recognize whom we are speaking to, the questions just simply cease. And then we ask boldly of the impossible because we know who we are speaking to. This is the God of the universe. In this moment of time, Sarah seems to laugh and can't even fathom this reality. I want to say to you again, remember, she describes herself in the Hebrew wording, she is a rotten, decaying corpse, and yet God can raise the dead. God can do that which is impossible, especially if we embody Job chapter 38 and 39. And so the thought of this becoming a reality brought forth laughter and disbelief. And then the next year, right where we are in Genesis chapter 21, the laughter returns but it isn't in dis disbelief, but the laughter of this crazy, impossible promise. It's no longer disbelief. She's pregnant. It became a reality. How is it possible that she could be nursing a baby at the age of 90? And so it is no coincidence that Abraham names the boy Isaac, which means laughter. See, when God starts fulfilling the impossible in our lives, it brings forth laughter. And if I'm being brutally honest with you, you want to ex when you experience the power of God in your life, you will find laughter and joy. Because guess what? It's not you doing it, it's God doing it. So often in my own life, I'm a hard worker. So often I will begrudgingly work hard. I'm not a joyous worker. I'll put my nose down and I'll work, work myself to, to the bone. It's out of, I don't know, obligation, hard work. I don't know what it is. But that's not the worker God is asking for. God is wanting a joyous and yes, laughing servant. And so often in my own life, when I'm not laughing and I'm not joyous, it's because I haven't experienced the power of God in my life for a long time. Because I'm telling you, when you are around people that have experienced the power of God, I have a mentor right now, he just annoys the heck out of me because he's just joyous and he laughs a lot. And I'm like, what is so great? And he challenges me on that. And I've been around him enough to know it's not just a front that he's doing. 
you know, anytime I'm around. Spent a lot of time with him now. And I just want you to know that when you're around people that have experienced the power of God, you're going to notice a trend. They're laughing and they're joyous. You just will. When people are coming to faith in Christ Jesus, when God's power is magnified and glorified, it brings a joy that is so hard to describe because it's out of our hands and we give the glory to the living God. It releases the, the stress. Can you imagine Abraham and Sarah, and we've talked about this, the stress and the anxiety that they must have felt? They, remember how many people? He had a military or an army of men of over 300 people. Think of the people he had to oversee. I mean, some of you are like, yeah, I got three kids. No, no, no. We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that he had to oversee. And their well-being depended on him having a child for the legacy to go on for their protection. That's some pressure. Can you imagine the relief that Abraham and Sarah felt when that boy was born? And they had to give it all to God because they already tried to force it on several different occasions, right? Didn't work out well. We talked about that. And they give, and he gives all the glory to the living God. God says that you can move mountains because nothing is impossible with him. Do we live in that reality in our lives? This is directly from Jesus' teachings. I hope today, after we finish here, in just these few verses, we're going to get back to tragedy, but I want to focus today on just God's fulfillment of the promise. I hope today we can see a bigger picture of who God is and come to him as a child, crying out to him, persistent, pleading with him, knowing that he can do the impossible. Thank you so much. Worship team, could you please come on up? I'm sorry, I didn't prep you ahead of time. I'm a little bewildered with the mic. I have to, I don't know, it's unusual with the mic. It's not as easy with my hands. I hope I've been okay. Have I not moved it away too much? Okay, wonderful. Let's continue to worship the living God. Yes, let's, uh, let's stand as we continue to sing on the love of God.
If you go into a church environment and there is no laughter, there's no joy, it's melancholy. I mean, I get it if you have a good Friday service, but if you're in a church and it's always melancholy, you need to run. Because it's just not what God's people are about. We are called to be joyous people. I remember uh, a quote, I'm not going to get it co exactly correct. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's translated from German anyways. But Karl Barth, okay, the stereotype of a German theologian. Y'all got him in your head? He says that taking life too seriously is a heresy. Because it's not depending on the sovereignty of God. Think about that. Because if we actually believe that God is in control and has all the power, there should be a lightness about us. We should be going through life joyously laughing, knowing that our God is the almighty God and he will take care of it all. I think there's something really important in what Karl Barth said. I don't often quote him, but today I will. Think about that. Go home today. How, what is your view of God? Some of us today, it might even just be not even that our view of God is so small and or it might be that our view of God is so small and it's so small that we haven't experienced the, the power of God in our life for a long time. Maybe we haven't asked for much. Maybe we don't want to bother God up with it. Maybe we've just been, you know, circling around the very simple regiment prayers that we have in our life. Maybe we need to go beyond that. Be a little bit more courageous in our prayer life. What would happen? What's the worst thing that would happen if we asked for something that was impossible? We'd maybe get a no. <laughs> it's already not happening. What's, what's the problem with asking our Lord and Savior? I think we need to change our view on who God is. And I want to challenge you today that if you're saying, I need prayer today, maybe you just need to experience the power of God. Maybe your view of God is rather limited, rather small, and you're not experiencing the joy of what we were discussing and what Sarah experienced. If that is you today, I'm going to be here in the front. The prayer team will be up here. We're here to pray with you. For the rest of you, I hope you'll go down to the lower auditorium and have some food and coffee and tea and just continue to fellowship. I want to say it's always been and it will continue to be such a blessing to share the word of God with you all. Could I have you stand? I want to stand for the benediction. I feel led to give this benediction. It says, now to him who is able to do far more than we could ever ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be all glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all the generations forever and ever. And can God's people please say? Amen. Amen. I hope to see you all next week right here at 10 a.m. Blessings.